Everyone, I'm Dr. Rebecca Griffith, the EDDPT. Welcome back to this next episode of Admitted or Not, the EDDPT podcast. And we are, I'm thrilled to have with me for a second episode in this series about the things we did during the pandemic. And I have with me Joanna, Taylor, and Nicole. And we're discussing in this episode, as a follow-up to our last episode, coping strategies we used during the pandemic, doing things we'd never done before in situations we'd never been in before while the world was going on around us, and how it impacted us in our careers. And so I'm going to just start with Joanna again. Yeah, so for me, it's ongoing. Um, I, I feel actually a little more struggle now with the kind of like Jekyll and Hyde life that I feel because I, I still feel like COVID is bad and just almost getting worse in terms of sheer volume and just the amount that I've read about the effects of COVID, even mild cases, and still seeing the sequelae at work. Right now we have a low number of COVID patients admitted for COVID. However, we are still a small branch of a major New York City hospital. And I remember my patients who were admitted for COVID just a couple of months ago who are back, not for COVID, but for these ongoing complications, exacerbations of, of comorbidities, probably worsened by COVID. So um, then I go to my other life in outpatient land, like in a gym, I practice out of a gym and I'm like, like, how are people not wearing masks? Like, how is this okay? Like, you know, you know, so I'm having a little trouble adjusting to like society feeling like COVID's over and New York is currently in its BA5 surge and nobody cares. That's, and that how it, that's how it feels. So it's been a bit tough for me more recently, I would say. During the first big waves, I felt like there was like collective decision to try to like take care of it and try to like actually prevent COVID from spreading and protect people. And now caution to the wind, you know? So I feel a little bit like, you know, like it's just a decision our culture has made. And, um, but things that have helped me, my coworkers, my team. I just love them dearly. My supervisors have been like amazing, so supportive. And, um, and then personally just, um, you know, pursuing things I know make me feel good exercise. I'm so lucky that I can, you know, exercise. I have a beautiful park and hobbies that I enjoy. I took up the violin because I knew in the winter there wouldn't be much to do. So I needed to expand my brain. So I just feel like okay, I have these things I know that make me feel better and how to figure out how to not be mad at people when they're riding the subway without masks. I haven't conquered that one yet. I still, I still get kind of mad at people. <laughs> I totally get it. And I, and I think from Colorado, we watch New York. You know, so what's happening in New York, we know that's us like three, four weeks from now. And so it's really interesting to me to hear you say that and that it's like never really stopped. And, and I went to New York in December briefly and felt like I needed to wear a mask on the street because there were so many, like the amount of humanity that is there is, is intense to me. And so definitely was wearing a mask while I was there as well. And I find it very ironic that we're recording this podcast while I'm sitting here with COVID right now <laughs> with a mild case of COVID. And for me, it, it, it is really... Um, it's really difficult to be home and isolated, even though I know it's the right thing to do. And, it, and it's why my family's doing that. But that's even coming from the perspective of a healthcare provider. So, so I hear you when people are like not taking it seriously and they're done protecting one another because it's been, it's been years. But for me, when that started, when we were health, when we were healthcare heroes, you know, people were delivering lunch to us and my, my friends and neighbors had taken up collections to like feed people that were working and people were dropping things on my porch, like bottles of wine and like homemade masks and scrub caps. And, and that really didn't last long. And now when you go out wearing a mask, people are like, can yell at you or like having to ask people to put on a mask in the hospital, like in the emergency department. I'm like, you need to put that like on, on you. <laughs> So I totally empathize with what you're saying. It's very frustrating. And I love that you say that you took up the violin. I want to know what everybody's thing is. I've heard of people that like adopted dogs, people that started sourdough. I started a fellowship, like I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> everybody has like that pandemic thing they did. 
Oh, I, I got my OCS. Love it. <laughs> that was last year. And this year I'm like, like no more certifications. Of course, now I'm doing a vestibular certification. Love but it. Like, <laughs> it's like, okay, one thing not PT related. How about music? <laughs> I love that. So a little professional and personal growth to help you combat <laughs> some of that frustration and that burnout. Yeah. It's perfect. Taylor, how about you? Um, you know, I didn't really get a chance to do something out of the ordinary just because I've been in school this whole time. <laughs> um, you survived. Maybe, yeah, I survived. Yeah, I was in survival mode, doing things a little bit differently. My school had us tested three days a week um, or three times a week. So I've had over a hundred COVID swabs. Um, but, you know, we made it through. And I think that my school was really good where I didn't lose anything. Like I didn't lose labs. I didn't lose clinicals. I was really lucky. Um, but I also would agree about just kind of the frustration from the general public. Um, I think right now, I mean, I live in a rural area right now with my parents and since I'm still kind of working in the hospital, we wear masks in the house. And I know that's kind of extreme, but they are elderly well, older. They wouldn't like if I said elderly. Um, they're older, they're in their 60s um, and have some underlying conditions. But um, I think it's just kind of <sighs> frustrating because even my friends, people who aren't directly in healthcare, they don't really understand that it's still an ongoing problem where we're still seeing COVID patients and we're still kind of at an enhanced risk every single day. And like, we're seeing it up close in the hospitals or in the subacute areas. Um, and it's kind of like they got it once and, and they're done with it now. They don't care. So just kind of reminding people, you know, we actually are in a surge right now. I know you don't care, but we are, and I'm going to take it seriously. What I have think, you found that really helped you kind of with stress management and the isolation of being in the pandemic? Yeah, so I would say just kind of like FaceTime and uh, Zoom meetings with friends um, because my roommates during 2020, they actually all moved out and went home. It was just me. So, I mean, I didn't have the fear of infecting any roommates, but it was also pretty lonely. I only went to work um, and then came home, but... Luckily, uh, FaceTime and then the friends dropping off the little gifts and confiding in the good friends. I think it kind of weeded out who was a true friend for me. <laughs> That's great. It's a hard lesson to learn though sometimes. Yeah, for sure. But I bet all of us can name people that we maybe not are, are not as great friends with now just based on how other people have chosen to deal with the pandemic and handle things. And I know some families have been broken apart by that. Mm -hmm. Nicole, how about you? Um, so I also got a certification. I got my GCS because I had some. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Again, again, I was like, why am I doing this right now? But whatever, I did it. It worked out well. Um, I started playing, and I haven't played in a while because life got crazy again. But I started playing the ukulele um, because what else did I have to do, quite honestly? Um, and then I started a garden. I stopped killing plants. I started a garden. My house is taking on a quite nice jungle vibe to it. And I've been hiking. I like, I always loved hiking, but it, you know, if all you could do is be outside, then I sure as heck was going to be out there. So this is going to be such a like snotty Colorado question. Okay. Where do you hike? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so like, are you uh, hiking? <laughs> yeah. Or are you walking? <laughs> I mean, sometimes I'm walking, but but there are actually mountains on the east coast. I don't know. I if think those are hills. Place. I think we call those hills. <laughs> 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 so I um, you know the the Delaware River. Um, there is a. I mean, I guess you would call it a hill, but it's on. <laughs> it's on. There's one in Pennsylvania and there's one in New Jersey and I've climbed up both of those. Um, I did actually, we took a family trip to a ski resort in um, New Hampshire, which is an actual mountain. Okay. But 
we we had stayed there before so we knew what it was like and um we climbed the ski mountain like we climbed loon we went up it instead of going down you know um and that was nice and was nice because you didn't really have to interact with other people because you were outside (laughs) and the hotel like was like here's room service for everything or like here's pickup for everything so they made it very easy to be there um at the time so this is like two years ago they made it very easy to be there um and feel safe which was really nice um so that was good so I did that so I mean I would call that a mountain but you know then too it is very flat near me I live basically at like elevation zero like sea level (laughs) I live at sea level um but there's a lot of really pretty like swamps I believe I've mentioned that I kind of enjoy swampy areas so it's like nice you can go in there and like I mean it sounds amazing when you describe it like that (laughs) no they are like there's so many different like just the uh the difference in wildlife and everything from like a beach region or from like the you know the coastal forests and the swampy areas um up into the mountains is very different and it's really interesting so you know you're uh i think you're your snotty colorado self 100 mm-hmm. <laughs> yep yep i'm gonna just but i'm gonna start telling everybody about the mountains of new jersey so that people start going there instead i'm gonna be like gosh did you know new jersey has these beautiful mountain swamps that you can visit <laughs> and it'll help you with your pandemic coping <laughs> I need no more tourists in my area. Okay. One word like the same. (laughs) I think one of the best things for our family was that I I kind of made my kids go on like a forced march every day when school was out. Right. Like, like the Von Trapps, like we were outside (laughs) and we were walking down the street and my kids know every sidewalk, every trail, every path in like a five mile radius of my house. And that's kind of a blessing because I know that they won't get lost. I know that they can bike those areas. I know that they can manage them safely. We had a lot of like rattlesnake training during that time. And like, these are the snakes you can touch and these are the snakes you can't touch. And like seeing my kids kind of bond together during the pandemic was such a gift. And I wonder now, like if they had been in school that whole time, Hmm. who would they be and how would they be? like, and the connections that they forged, like, during this time when they've been, like, primarily just with one another, like, what a gift, really, that is to have that, and to have that time together, and to look back and, like, know also, for me, like, what a good team my husband and I were during the, like, height of things, because it was to the point where we were, like, splitting time, like, we're one of us would work because neither of us could work from home. So one of us would work for several days and then the other one would work for several days. And and we might not see each other for like 18 days while we were trying to do that. And it was just the two of us with our three kids. And and we really figured out how to do it and like how to take care of ourselves and how to take care of our family while continuing to be successful. And I think our life today is different than it would have been like my husband ultimately transitioned to a job where he could work from home and where he works very close to where my kids go to school. So if there is an issue at the school or an exposure, like he can just get them and they can all go home together. And I was able to change my work schedule to, to be something that was more flexible for my family. I work longer days now, but fewer days. And I don't know that the flexibility for that would have happened had we not had these like crisis changes during the pandemic. But so I think my last question for all of you is like, how has this changed you as a physical therapist? I'll start. I feel like um, this has certainly given me an opportunity to learn more about cardiopulmonary diseases and Mm -hmm. just feel more comfortable with very sick people. Yes. Like my threshold for freaking out is way, way different. 100%. Yep. And um, yeah, so it certainly just made me simply more interested. Like in school, I was like in cardiopulmo, I was really like, I think I'm too dumb for this. Like, I really don't think I could ever do this. And so being like kind of thrown in the deep end, it actually got me really interested. So in the first wave, I would just like, I would 
come home and like crack open my cardio palm book from school and which I kept very optimistically thinking maybe one day <laughs> I'll like learn something about this. Yeah, I've got my shelf right here. I might need to open it up. Yeah, it's gotten me more comfortable as well um, in the interdisciplinary setting. Mm -hmm. uh, feeling like it's okay to not know everything and how to ask for support from, you know, to not be intimidated by by like veteran nurses or RTs or doctors or even my other colleagues, you know, I think I kind of came in a little bit sheepish to acute care. And, you know, now also like, as some of you already said, we know our colleagues on such a deeper level. We're almost like family, even with nursing, the nurses that were there. And so I feel much more comfortable saying, Hey, can I just get some feedback? about something here. You know, I just really want to pick your brain. So that's been really helpful to kind of just like, kind of shatter my ego a little bit in a way of like, which is, of course, I mean, we work in very complex settings. Um, yeah, and I think, I think like learning how to support people that might not get better, like how to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I really like realized so quickly into the pandemic that also just acute care in general, um, a lot of us became PTs because we want to see people get better. Yeah. Like whether we grew up with sporting injuries or like this kind of like implicit optimism about the human potential. Yeah. And that's not always the case. And at first I didn't know how to talk to people who are dying or nowadays, now that we can have visitors and families, how do you talk to families of people that might not make it? So I've learned a lot about just communication and um, supporting people and not fearing like facing death so much. Yeah, I, I have a whole nother soapbox about how we physical therapists need to be much more involved in hospice care, having um, had two family members die in the last couple of years, as well as some friends whose, whose mothers were on hospice journeys. And I had the privilege of like helping walk those people home and helping them make it through that end of life transition. And I think there's a huge role for physical therapy there, but that is gonna be a, a whole different podcast. But I love what you said about our implicit optimism about human potential. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful statement about physical therapy. But I also think that you're absolutely right, that we need to be comfortable with when there isn't that potential left and what can we offer at that point. That was beautiful. All right, Taylor, you're up. I mean, this, this has got to be pretty formative for you. I feel like your whole trajectory has probably changed. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know much about acute care when I went into my co-op and then I got thrown into the pandemic. Um, Welcome but it did, to the defense. It didn't scare me away. <laughs> um, I, it actually kind of drew me in. Um, and I would also say that my, my final clinical placement was in acute care and we had patients with COVID and it was really kind of... I don't know, not, not a good thing that I had all this experience with working with these patients already, but it kind of was a good thing where I wasn't the one in charge of things, but I was watching as a co-op. Um, and then when I was a clinical student, I got to be the person who was in charge. And like uh, Joanna had said about the threshold for freaking out, um, I think as a clinical student would have been pretty low, but I had the experience of kind of ambulating with patients with COVID and seeing their O2 stats and um, realizing <laughs> when to just reach over and turn up the O2 um, and then tell the nurse, tell them later. Um, so, I mean, I'm excited to start my career. It definitely didn't cause me to burn out or anything, which I'm uh, lucky to have. I mean, I have had breaks with school to be fair, but um, I'm really, really excited to start in acute care in Boston this coming fall. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. All right, Nicole, what do you think? What do I think? I think, I mean, it cemented for me that I really like the clinical complexities 
that come in inpatient physical therapy, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I appreciate outpatient therapists. I just don't think I'm meant to be one, you know? Um, like my threshold for freaking out, like I knew that it was, it was different, but it, again, it reinforced it. I think it really taught me a lot about, um, if you think about the phrase, like practicing at the top of my license, mm-hmm. it really taught me a lot of things um, about how to do that. It taught me to like really trust my instincts um, when it comes to, like you said, like the triage, like I know I, I know my patients, I know them, I can read these signs um, and I'm actually pretty good at recognizing them. And I realized that, um, and that is like a good skill. It also taught me a lot about, um, you know, there's a role in PT that uh, advocating plays for our patients already, um, but there is another level when you are fighting like the hospital system to get a patient sent somewhere. <laughs> and you're like, no, really, they need to leave. And they're like, no, we can't take them if they're not, if they're not serious. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm telling you it's serious. And like to, to push back on that, I think is something that I learned, um, you know, advocating for our staff to make sure that we were safe and that we had the PPE that we needed, um, I think taught me a lot. Um, I know that I have the ability now, like, I mean, research understanding like how important it is to be on top of it and to understand like where your sources are and to find things quickly and to be okay with um uncertainty and developing knowledge right and like just kind of understanding like when you should plow ahead with what you've got and like also that balance of like I still don't know this but I know this and so I can work up to here And then I'm still going to keep learning and going. And I feel like that was an important lesson too, right? Like you don't need to know everything. You need to know how you can learn it. And you need to know that you don't know everything and work appropriately there. I love it. I think for me, the thing that I learned the most was what an asset physical therapists are in this type of situation. Because if you think about it in an acute care setting, like we are so well poised to flex. Mm-hmm. We can't, we we're familiar with every unit in the hospital. We know where everything is. We understand the chain of command on every unit. We know who's sick and who's not sick. We can assess vitals and know what to do with that information. We can mobilize patients. We can help patients with ADLs. We can help patients with their eating. We can help like patients, like I I even worked as a sitter several times. We know how to calm down agitated patients. We can use our bodies to move things and people. Like, so we are so well poised to really be utility players in the setting of an emergency. And I think that that just goes to show that physical therapists are a vital part of the healthcare system and in some ways a lot more flexible and more useful than other providers. And I think that we showed up and showed out um, when we were needed most. And my hope is that we'll continue to be needed because I think with long COVID and the number of people who are gonna be disabled by this pandemic, there is going to be work for physical therapists for many years as a result of this pandemic that's ongoing. So I think that's kind of my takeaway is that that when we weren't necessarily needed as much for the traditional physical therapy role, we were able to slip into many, many roles and to help our serve our communities during the pandemic. And that we'll still answer the call as it changes and our society grows in this particular situation. Any final thoughts from any of you? I just feel so grateful I got to like talk with you all and hear your stories. I love hearing other people's perspectives and what you all learn. And I feel like just, I don't want to say lucky that we've been through this, but I feel lucky that I'm able to have these conversations with people and get their perspectives and, you know, just, just see everything that we are capable of as a profession, as humans and as members of our community. I echo that. Yeah. I'm really grateful that I saw your tweet and reached and you reached out. So I'm really grateful to meet you all on screen. And um, also like, I feel like life moves so fast and clinical Mm -hmm. practice is so dynamic that it's almost easy. It's like, we're constantly in the present moment. Like what are the needs of the day? Like every day in the clinic is so kind of exciting. Like there's never a boring day. So I don't often sit with people and talk about what we've been through 
right. even with my colleagues. Like if we're in the office, like chatting or like, you know, we're, we're chatting about the day, you know, like what patient did you see? Cause PT, OT share an office at my work, which is amazing. So I'm like, Hey, OT, did you see this patient? Are you going to see, you know, but like, we never just sit in process. Right. <laughs> so I'm grateful for that opportunity. <laughs> I love that. And I think it's a, a disservice that we haven't had the space or the time to really sit down and, and be like, these are the things we've been carrying. And these are the things, like when I have, I had um, some people that were close to me that, that literally were like, it's just a virus. And I had those moments where I was like, if you had seen the things that I have seen and um, done the things that I've done, during the last couple of years, they just don't think that you would feel that way. And it, and it can be a little hurtful. So it's nice to be able to talk to people who've had similar experiences to be able to kind of unload a little bit. Taylor, anything from you? Yeah, um, I was just going to say that I would agree that it's been nice to kind of have this camaraderie and hear that everyone kind of went through something similar, a little bit different, but similar also um it's just comforting i think because i know only a few people um that i'm close with kind of went through this um so it's just nice to hear and to be heard well i appreciate all of you sharing this with me and with anybody who's listening because i know it can be hard to talk about some of these things and i also want to just acknowledge each one of you specifically for the role that you took on during the pandemic to support your communities and your patients. I mean, it was it's truly heroic, the things that you've done. And I wanna acknowledge you for that and make sure that you feel like seen and recognized for your efforts. Thank you. And you as well. Thanks. You too. So if you enjoyed this podcast episode today, I encourage you to like and subscribe. You can find our podcast on Sounder FM as well as YouTube. And in coming episodes, we're going to have Dr. Mika Mitchell with us to help us do some mindfulness meditation for maybe those moments when we are feeling a little bit overwhelmed, feeling like we are carrying a little too much, and particularly in the emergency setting where things can be a little chaotic. I think it'll be nice to have that episode to help us learn how to center and debrief ourselves when things get to be a little bit too much. Thank you all so much for your time and we appreciate you listening.